Sandy Shore. That was the name of the black-coated bandit's son. I kept watching him from across one of the picnic tables in the Arbu Common lot as I ate from the meaty bowl of stew that the good ponies of Arbu had offered us. Sandy Shore was lethargic, slow to respond, and very withdrawn. His eyes were red from crying, but he wasn't crying now. He was just staring at his stew with very little interest. I empathized. It was an absolutely delicious stew. Radgator is good eaten, but I just didn't have an appetite. I put another spoonful in my mouth, chewed, and swallowed mostly from remote memory. My pipa clicked slowly at me. The stew was made with mildly irradiated river water. After the radiation exposure at gummies, I wasn't so concerned about the uh, negligible amount I was ingesting from the dirty water used in the stew. I was a touch worried about the colt, but I had to imagine that he had ingested worse. Often, and at least, the water in his glass was pure rainwater. So, what's the market here? I heard Velvet Remedy ask. She and Clamby were chatting amiably with several of the Ambu ponies and the caravan merchant at the next table. Strelos was sitting nearby, keeping watch over Elder Cottage Cheese in his medical pod as the repair spell enhanced to his armor, slowly patched up the gaping holes created by Amaranth's anti-tank guns. I wasn't sure what Strelos planned to do with the Elder now, but I didn't think he knew either. We're always looking for parts to keep that damned piece of shit water purifier working. Emerald Fire, the green mare I had met before, told her. And more right away, especially for when it's broke, which is like every day that ends in Y. Beyond that, basic supplies. And by the fucking goddess, if we could just get ourselves some toilet paper. By the goddess? Which one? Or did they actually follow that one here? Velvet Army caught it too. The goddess? She asked politely. Yeah, you know, unity and all that crap. We're all going to be together as one, ain't we? Emerald Fire's voice, uh, raised voice brought laughter from nearby picnic tables. Lowering her voice. We had one of her wandering preachers come through a few years back. It was a bad year for us, so we took some solace in him. Velvet Remedy nodded, then redirected the conversation. So what do you barter with here? Meat, the milk-colored mare spoke up proudly, coming from generations of radgator hunters. She thumped a hoof on her chest and stood... I understood now why she didn't want us killing the monsters in the hatchery. The radgators were her livelihood. I faded out of the conversation. I was having trouble keeping focus. I looked down at my stew and realized I'd eaten more of it than I thought. My head was throbbing, even behind the painkillers. Sandy Shore had vanished away from the table, and I was wandering off towards a section of the strip mall, which had once been a helping hoof quickie, a quick care. Amongst the faded posters and flyers papering its windows, I spotted a gray one with black block letters. Remember what separates ponies from zebras. Not stripes, not cutie marks, but what is inside. There is good in all of us. No pictures, no ministry affiliations. It almost looked like it could have been locally made. Embarrassment pushed through my numbness. I hoped Zenith hadn't seen us. I looked across to the lot where she was eating food of her own cooking. Alone, save for the merchant's cattle, one of whom had bandages wrapped around its leg, courtesy of Velvet Remedy. What other marks on your flank? I heard Calamity ask as I got from the table and then way over to Zenith. They look like brands. There was an odd tone in his voice. It's an onbu mark, the mayor told him proudly. We get it after we eat the heart of our first kill. Only ponies with an arbu mark 
can vote in the town council. I settled down next to Zenith, turning out the conversation the others were in. I was having trouble following any of it anyway. Probably the concussion. Or maybe it just didn't seem to matter. It was hard for such little things to seem important, when I kept seeing Sandy Shore hugging his father, crying. Or the mayor, whose eye had become a horrific black moon sun thing. Or the unicorn scribe, murdered by her own rangers in some sort of political move I didn't understand. I looked at what Zenith was eating. Please tell me you didn't refuse to offer they didn't refuse to offer you food, I said. My hackles raising. No, she said simply. I cooked for the medical pony and myself. Neither of us care for stews of meat. I just hope I did not offend. Oh. Oh yeah, that makes sense. We should be apologizing to you then, I replied initially. Why? Well, because. I glanced back in the direction of the poster. Maybe she hadn't seen it. <clears throat> you did not write that. Damn it. She had. Nor any of the ponies alive today. Here, or elsewhere. You should not apologize for what you ponies, who are not you, did a long time ago, when you were not around to stop them. My head swam a bit, and it took me a moment to realize we weren't just talking about ponies. I nodded, understanding. None of us would blame you for what happened in the war. I paused, realizing that wasn't correct. Well, Steelhoos would. But I think even he's coming around. <clears throat> My thoughts returned to the poster. They could have painted over it, though. They are hunting their prey to extinction, Zenith informed me. Soon, there will be no meat to barter with. I do not begrudge them for not spending what little they have on such luxuries as paint. I thought of the number of radigators we had seen in the hatchery. When I had been thinking we might have to fight them, there had been a lot. But when viewed as both food and trading supplies, there were hardly any. I hoped the river held significantly more, and found myself wondering what a bad year amounted to here in Arbu. My brain seemed to slip. I felt like I had lost a bit of time. Back at the tables, I heard Calamity asking where the new graves were. I felt a sudden urge to pay my respects to the bandit I had killed, no matter how l <clears throat> ludicrous or meaningless the act would be. Oh, we ain't buried them yet, an Arbu Buck replied. Ground's too mushy. Got the bodies locked up in the clinic cellar for now. Emerald Fire shot a dark look at the buck. Calamity nodded. Velvet Remedy coughed with alarm. Hey, isn't that where Sandy Shore was heading? Don't worry, miss. Got the cellar locked up tight. No pony's gonna get in there without a key. Yeah, because apparently the only pony in the entire wasteland who could pick a lock is me. No wait. There is at least one other. Probably part of the Philadelphia Steel Rangers. Or maybe some pony who works with Red Eye. I stopped, suddenly suspicious that my lockpicking rival must be Red Eye himself. I had no facts to base such an assumption on, but it felt right. The sense of duality was too perfect. A certain. The, <clears throat> the certainty slipped from my wounded mind almost as quickly as it manifested. I found myself staring at a puddle and not knowing how long I had been doing so. I looked up swiftly enough for my head to pound, but every pony was where they were when I last saw them, except Sandy, who was sitting morsely on the corner between the clinic and the dark vertical wall sign for Starbucked, the coffee shop that wasn't Java Cup. As the first rays of sunlight dripped, dipped beneath the cloud cover, the wall sign lit up, bucked on by some ancient timer, miraculously still running. Other lights flickered on, about a third of them still functioning, illuminating the mall in patchwork pools of light. My eyes caught on the sign and lingered there. An image of two very attractive mares, twins, one with an ice cream colored mane and a coffee brown coat, the other with the same brown in her mane 
and a creamy coat, who were entwined around each other, almost as if much of their tails were entwined around the cups of steaming coffee with the Starbucks logo. All backlit by lights that flickered and threatened to go out. A mind slipped a logo for them. Buy our coffee, and we'll let you watch us make out. What was that? Zenith asked. I flushed with embarrassment, as I realized I just said that out loud. Ah, uh, nothing. I'm just looking. I winced, and quickly clarified. At the coffee shop over there. Zenith followed my gaze. Are they bucking the stars? Or are the stars bucking them? I think they're bucking each other, I replied, before I realized she wasn't paying attention to the lesbian sensuous the, the mares. I thought about turning to see her expression, but my eyes didn't want to leave the sign. Are you alright, little one? Concussion, I answered. Then, in a transition that only made sense to me at the time. Though Remy talks to Brahmin now. Oh, yep. She's a real kind pony, that one. One of the Brahmin responded. Polite, too. I began to nod. Yes. She really... Was a what? I jumped back up, stumbling backwards over Zenith, and fell on my tail. The Brahmin's right head smiled at me, while the left one continued chewing its curd obliviously. Y you can talk? I stammered, then flushed. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know Brahmin were, well, smart. The Brahmin had asked as I picked myself up, looking at Zenith apologetically. The zebra just shook her head. Uh, yeah, I admitted, feeling foolish. She chortled. Not many ponies ever try to talk to us. Not that I blame you. Most of us are dumb as poets. Or as posts. <clears throat> Ain't that right, Herbert? She said, looking to her other head. The other head kept chewing. I looked to Zenith, but she was just watching me with amusement. Yeah, I don't really get to have any good conversation from him, she said dourly. You, uh, I, I felt stupid. Sorry. Concussion. Brain no worky. Um, I'm Little Pip. Well, howdy there, Little Pip. I'm Bess, and this is my other half, Bob. Bob? I asked, wondering how one head could be male and the other female. I looked by Bess over. She sported several bandages, including a bandaged leg and a medical brace, courtesy of Elder Remedy. Definitely a female Brahmin, judging by her bulging udder although I couldn't recall if I'd seen any male Brahmin. Not that I hadn't... not that I'd been paying attention to notice, even if I had. Yep, Bob, the Brahmin told me. I just call him Herbert, to get him on his nerves. Oh. From the looks of Bob, nothing much could get him on his nerves. I didn't think Bob was even aware that the conversation was going on. Most Brahmin got two heads, but only half a brain between them. I'm one of the lucky ones, Bess claimed. If you can count being saddled for life with Bob, here, lucky. Anywho, tell that mare friend of yours thanks again for patching up my leg. Did a real fine job, too. Polite, as well. A mare from the Ministry of Peace took Darling away yesterday. Apparently, she's being held at a WSD treatment facility in Manhattan. I picked up a renewable one-month pass on the Luna Line so I can visit her regularly. I had our first snow today. Winter brings its own set of problems to the mall. Now I'm in charge of shoveling snow from the sidewalks and rooftops, keeping the lot salted so no pony has an accident. Business is picking up for the coffee shops. Most of the other stores are suffering from normal drop in customers. Only the regulars are up to braving the snow. Caught a couple of hoodlums spray painting disparaging things about Princess Luna on the back side of Sunny Suds. One of the delinquents tried claiming WTS, or W, 
as indeed, what the fuck, as a defense of his actions. And that pissed me right off, having a family member who was really suffering. I'm sick of seeing ponies use WSD as an excuse for what's really just bad behavior. Then the other little bastard turned his spray can towards me, and I finally got a chance to use his cow prod. He was still shaking when the police ponies arrived. Spent the afternoon giving statements. Miss Weathers' damned poodle peed on my leg while I was talking to the officer. I really wanted to club that little monster with the prod as well. As the autolog ended, I trotted slowly over to the table, where Velvet Remedy and Calamity were still chatting with the Arbu ponies. The merchants had finished eating, and were rolling, and was rolling out of sleeping ba a sleeping bag just inside the shattered storefront of what had been a comic book shop, sandwiched between sunny suds and custard cakes. I could see another sword mirror's poster on the wall, above rows of empty shelves. This is the fifth time this year the damned water purifiers burned out. Honestly, I don't think the little bastard is simply beyond hope. We keep fixing her up and Jerry rigging her together, but there's only so much we can expect. Emerald Fire was telling Calamity. Once it's gone, I don't know what we'll do. We tried negotiating with the Steel Rangers for access to their water talisman. But all they do is shoot at us. I came to a halt, blinking. Wait. I looked up at the dark silhouette of Buckland Cross. Scattering lights, illuminating small bits of the shadowed pier that towered out of the water just downstream of Arbu. Turning to Steel Hooves, I asked. That bit of bridge had a water talisman built into it? No, Steel Hooves replied with a slightly derasive tone. But Elder Cottage Cheese brought back several with him from his raid on the Ministry of Peace Hospital near Friendship City. Friendship... I paused. Hold on. Several? Yes. Even then, I think he was planning ahead. Damn it! Grandpa Rattle screamed out of his loft. You fuckers still here? Get out of Arbu before it's too late! Emerald Fire face hoofed. Well, some pony shut him up. A couple of ponies, including the one eyed, milk colored pony, scooted off. Now I've got a shotgun! I ignored him, turning to Emerald Fire. They have several water talismans in there, and they won't give you clean water? My mental haze was fading, sharpened into deadly focus. The green pony, with a cute little flame for a cutie mark above her, Arbu brand, nodded. We don't have much. Red gators have been getting scarce. But we're willing to trade what we've got for good water. I felt simmering anger. Why should you have to? It's water. You need it to live. Steel Hoops bristled. Calamity jumped up. Whoa there, little pip. He neighed as he flew over to me. Nothing wrong with selling necessities, if that's what you got to sell. He whispered hastily. Do you remember that these folk make a living selling meat? Steel Hooves nickered under his breath. Applejack sold apples. Got a problem with that? I stopped, checking myself. In the stable, these of life are provided by the stable. Basic food, water, a place to stay, even barding. Work was assigned too, according to our stable ta special talent. We paid only for luxuries, either from the allowance that the Overmare assigned, or from the grains of profitable hobbies. That worked for Stable too, but it was not the way of the Equestrian Wasteland. Still, I couldn't help but feel angry at the Steel Ranger's refusal. That's different, I insisted finally. You're talking about ponies who work for what they sell. These ponies are risking life and limb hunting. Even gardeners toil to grow their vegetables. But the Steel Rangers, this is a water talisman. It provides water freely. They didn't even create it. They stole it. Scavenged, Calamity corrected curtly. Fine, scavenged. So they worked to get it too. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't share. My voice was rising. Unbidden, a stupid song floated back into my head. You gotta share, you gotta care. It's the right thing to do. I hated the song, but at the same time, 
It struck me as impossibly sage. Sandy Shore's glass had been filled with pure rainwater. But what would happen when the rainwater ran out and the water purifier still refused to function? I killed the poor Colt's father. The least I could do was make sure the water he was drinking wasn't fucking poison. I owed him that much. I owed him a hell lot more. Little Pip, thought what everybody asked curiously, what are you thinking? Load up Elder Cottage Cheese, I barked to Steel Hooves. If I was the leader here, then I was damned well going to lead. We're heading to Buckland Cross, but this time, we're not giving their Elder back for free. We're bartering. Steel Hooves neighed. Judging from what happened this afternoon, what makes you think they even want their Elder back? He walked towards me. I've been thinking about this all even, little Pip, and I'm convinced they were hoping he would die at our hooves, or at least that they could claim so with little opposition. Dead, he's a martyr for their cause. Alive, he's the elder who keeps sending steel rangers to their deaths in the Cantalot ruins, and whose leadership led to the crippling of the Manhattan contingent in his efforts to take Stable 2 and Stable 29. I stared back at him, taking it in. You think they'll attack us again? Probably. Good. I hissed. Little Pip! Velvet Remedy gasped. I turned to her. I didn't start this, but I'm itching to end it. One way or another. We're coming back from Buckland Cross with a water talisman. I scowled. No. Make that two. We're getting one for Stable 29 as well. Clemity shook his head. Little Pip. Thinks us through. Do that. You sign Aru's death warrant. I stepped back, stunned by his words. Right now, they're nothing to the Steel Rangers. You give them a water talisman, and you give them something the Steel Rangers want. And they know the way they'll come take it away. I grimaced, thinking of the Steel Rangers' attack on Stable 2. Oh, I have. Not. Forgotten. Velvet Remedy cringed, her voice soft, and still slightly raspy. Little Pip, I know where this comes from. There is part of my heart that wants revenge on them too. But this isn't right. No, I stomped. I think it is. And I think it's about damn time. I looked over my friends. They were eyeing me with concern. Maybe even fear. I understand if you don't want to come with me on this one. I won't think less of you. Zenith held her tongue as she had done for years. Still saying nothing, she trotted to my side. Calamity shook himself, spreading his wings. I ain't saying I don't want to go. I'm just saying we do it smart. Friendship City ain't too far from here. We take the water talisman there, and Velvet Remedy talks him into a trade. That includes water rots for the Arbor Ponies. I nodded. Calamity's plan was much more sound than mine. So, you're in. Hells yeah, Calamity grinned. You think I'd pass up on a chance for an adventure with you? After all my whirling about being left behind? Velvet Remedy face hoofed. Some point you should stay here with Pyrelight, she began, then sighed. But, you ponies are going to get yourselves killed without me. She looked at me sternly. But I don't like this. And I'm going to do the negotiations. I don't think any of you are diplomatically inclined towards the Seal Rangers right now. Are you? Calamity asked her. No. Velvet admitted. But unlike most of you, I can fake it. Spend time with Sis today filling out applications for a place in one of Stable Tech's war shelters. The non-refundable deposit took most of my paycheck, but it was worth it just to take one worry off my sister's head. Ever since Darling was taken, she's been slipping from me. I think she's been drinking, although I can never smell it on her breath when I'm over. I've been to visit Darling twice this month. She's definitely looking better, and has some of her cheer back. Whatever the Ministry of Peace is doing to treat her, it seems to be working. She's almost like her old self now. 
Only thing I've noticed that seems to be a bit off is that she seems to have forgotten things. I asked her about a birthday party, and she got strangely quiet, then told me she doesn't remember having one this year. The mayor I spoke to at the hospital says that temporary memory loss is a side effect of her therapy. Honestly, it was just so good to see Darling smile again that I was fine with it. I saw one of those little hoodlums that I caught spray painting a couple months ago. He was dressed up, dressed up fine, mane combed, looking presentable. He stopped on the street to thank me for helping him out on the right path. I was so stunned, I told him it was my pleasure. I asked him how the other buck was doing. He looked away, saying something about trying not to think about bad influences. Things at the strip mall have been interesting. Mr. Bean and Jimocha Joe have stepped up their ad advertising war. I fully expect to get an earful from Mr. Bean last week when Jimocha erected, no pun intended, that huge, hot and steamy Starbucks sign with a twin espresso and latte laying over each other, surrounded by steaming cups of Starbucks. But he seemed almost cheerful about it. I found out why yesterday, when the new Java Cup sign went up. Not as much sex appeal, but the billboard was huge, easily 20% larger than the Starbucks billboard. And the whole thing is done in patriotic colors, with an image of Princess Luna in the corner endorsing it as the best thing to keep you up all night. I have to wonder if he got permission to use her image like that. Jermacha Joe spent most of today trying to persuade me that the Java Cup's billboard was too big against regulations and a hazard come a next windstorm. I told him to file his complaints with the zoning office. The sun was setting as the Sky Bandit flew towards the black form of Buckingham Cross. Oh, Nelly! Clemmy shouted, pulling up sharply as half a dozen automated turrets pulled our way. Velvet Remedy threw a shield around him as the guns opened fire. Bullets and lances of colored light filled the air around us. I focused, my horn glowing, as Velvet Remedy cast her disintegration ward over us. The light of my magic flickered around each turret on Buckingham Cross. Not just the ones shooting at us, but all of them. For good measure, I extended my spell over the sentinel robots I could make out on the bridge. Calamity danced in the air, trying to keep the Sky Bandit from taking more than a few minor hits by putting himself between the gun and us. The shield around him was taking so many bullets, it looked like a sparkler. I focused harder, working as fast as I could. I knew I could do this. I'd done it effectively before. Just yesterday, I crawled under the Sky Bandit and swapped out the spark batteries. I had the technical expertise. This was easy, but it was taking longer than I wanted. Calamity's shield went down, a stream of bullets tearing through it and slashing across his side. Flesh wounds, little more than scratches, but over a dozen of them. He yowled, and he suddenly dropped several yards as he briefly forgot how to fly. Calamity spread his wings and caught the air, again, as Velvet Remedy threw up another shield as quickly as she could. All the turrets shut down simultaneously. I had unscrewed their maintenance panels and pulled out the spark batteries. They were dead. The Sentinel robots as well. I scowled, floating several dozen spark batteries back to the Sky Bandit. I was going to give the Steel Rangers every chance to do the right thing. But if the exchange today went was strike one, then this was strike two. Calamity lifted us back up and flew in for a landing. Responses came back from Stable Tech today. Sis found them in the mail. She was weeping over them when I got home from work. I've been accepted. She was not. I've been given a special broadcaster. When the call comes, I'm to make my way to Stable 34. The broadcaster will be in my will be my proof of acceptance, according to the letter, which warned me not to lose it. I offered to give my sister the broadcaster, and thus my place in Stable 34, but she refused. She says she shouldn't be out here anyway, or she should be out here anyway. If the warning comes, she'll try to make it to Darling. I spent most of the evening pleading with her as she drank herself into a stupor. The rest I spent crying and trying to convince myself that it doesn't matter anyway. The stables will never be used, after all. There's no way the zebras would dare use weaponized mega spells. 
It would mean their destruction, and surely our own. I have to believe that. It's bad when work has become the high point of my day, but I'm not sure how long that will last. Java's Cup is still losing a lot of business to Starbucks, and Mr. Bean is getting desperate. Today Mr. Bean's added a new vending machine to his coffee shop, an iron shod ammo emporium vendor. Now you can buy your caffeine and your bullets in one easy step. No good can come from this. As we landed, Velvet Army tossed up a shield in front of the Sky Bandit, molding it between the ruins of several chariots and then stepping out. Several Steel Rangers came charging towards us. A rocket whisked out one of the battle saddles, impacting the shield, which immediately collapsed in a stark reminder of the limitations of our own unicorn's magical power. Greetings, Steel Rangers, Velvet said, magnifying her voice magically. We come in peace to negotiate the safe return of your esteemed elder. I was willing to forgive this missile, but if they shot at her after her greeting, that would get them strike three. The Steel Ranger slowed to a brisk trot. They were not firing. At least, not yet. Buckland Cross is the property of the Steel Rangers, one of them called out, his voice magnified with the armor she wore. Leave at once. Any negotiations will commence afterwards. I know what this place is, Knight Riverseed. Steelhoofs announced, stepping out of the Sky Bandit and striding up to Velvet Remedy's side. And you would do well to mind your place. You are in the presence of two elders, one of whom is speaking to you. St Star Paladin Steelhoofs? The Nightmare asked, clearly recognizing Steelhoofs' unique voice. She stammered, trotting in place for a moment. What? What? We d don't recognize your authority anymore. You're a traitor. No, I'm a loyalist to, the loyalist to the Ministry Mayor, and the true purpose of the Rangers, Steelhoof said flatly, and you are well behind the ears knight, barely graduated from initiate, Knight Riverseed. Send out the pony in charge here. Um, that would be me, sir. Steelhoof stood silent, then calmed. You're kidding. The Steel Ranger stared back at us. Three more joining the three already facing us. I spotted two more stepping out of doorways, high on the stone arches above, taking sniper positions. Shilhu's voice can't hide his disbelief. You're kidding, right? N no sir, Knight Riverseed said, shifting hesitantly into a battle stance. And I'm afraid I ha have to ask you to, to leave. I can see you're afraid, Knight Riverseed. Steelhoofs replied, but we have come bringing Elder Cottage Cheese, whom we will return to you in exchange for two of your water talismans, stored here in Buckingham Cross. After that, we will leave, not before. Velvet Army was looking uncomfortable. Clearly, her intention to be the negotiator had gone up in smoke. I brought up my eyes forward sparkle and slid out the sniper rifle, targeting the two ponies in sniper positions. Even with my skill and targeting spell, it would be a tricky shot to hit either of, the, either of them. But even if I missed, I could at least pin them down. The Steel Rangers looked as taken aback as they could, considering that they were completely concealed behind metal armor. I... I'm sorry? What was that? After the disgraceful actions of Paladin Amaranth at the previous exchange, you were lucky we were asking such a low price for the return of your elder. Steelhoofs informed her flatly. Whom your own pony shot at, so be careful whom you call traitor. Knight Riverseed hesitated once more, then took a step forward. What? Well, we cannot comply with these demands of yours, and you know it. Request denied. Now get off our citadel. The two light machine guns on her armor's built-in battle saddle clicked as they reloaded, pointed threateningly at us. But my EFS was not registering her as hostile. It was a bluff. Are you really going to attack an elder with 200 years combat experience, backed by a team of wasteland heroes who have defeated a dragon? Steelhoofs asked warningly. You can't win.
I can't give you one water talisman, much less two. She spat back. Your offer is absurd, and you are trespassing. It sounded like it was going downhill, but no pudding was read on my EFS compass yet. We could still talk this out. I was beginning to really hope we could. I hadn't realized how badly the losses at Stable 2 and 29 had depleted the Manhattan contingent of Steel Rangers. The battle earlier today must have taken out the remaining hierarchy. All that were left were the knights left behind to guard the fort, and probably a hoof full of scribes. These weren't the ponies who attacked Stable 2. They weren't the ponies who attacked us earlier. They weren't even the ones responsible for refusing water to the civilians of Arbu. Pow! One of the snipers fired at steel hooves. The knight wasn't even red on my compass. I think it was just an accident. The bullet ricocheted off the ghoul's magically powered armor and struck Velvet Remedy. She fell with a yelp, bleeding out of a hole in her neck, flank, her blood running down her night nightingale cutie mark. Everything went to hell. Stop shooting at us, I yelled. Surrender! The two unicorn scribes were clearly panicking. With all the alarms and the explosions outside, I wasn't surprised. One of them cast a blinding spell that filled the stairwell with strobe lights. I closed my eyes tightly and fired blindly with the poison dart gun, not wanting to kill these ponies. Unfortunately, they weren't showing the same restraint. A cackle of lightning cut through the air, making my coat hairs stand on end and filled the stairwell with the smell of ozone. I backed up the stairwell, pressing against the wall, nearly tiff tripping on the steps. One of the unicorns had combat spells. I fired again, hoping that I could hit them, couldn't hit them, that I could at least stop them from getting any closer. The two water talismans we had come to procure dangled from my horn on chains. They were amazingly small things, no bigger than a particularly gaudy necklace. They radiated a cool power from the large sapphires in the center of their golden latticework, but were otherwise almost unremarkable. I had braved the internal rooms of the pier and picked one of the hardest locks I had ever come across in order to get them, but my relatively stealthy entrance was obliterated when the alarms went off. I felt a cool breeze as I could clearly hear the sound of Steelhoof's grenade minigun as he battled knights with a fraction of the skill but just as much ridiculous firepower. When I dodged into the interior of Buckland's Cross, Clement had been swerving through the air, dealing with the two remaining sentinel tanks, the ones I'd missed. Another bolt of electricity flashed out, this one hitting me square in the breast. My body locked with intense pain, my magic imploded, and the dark gun went trembling down the stairs. I teetered, gasping, and fell back through the window. Freefall, just for a fraction of a second, but long enough for the point in my head to be convinced that I was falling to my death. Then I hit the melted girder, girder. I opened my eyes, blinking. My vision was swimming with foreign colors and shapes from the blinding strobe spell. I was laying in one of the un understruts that had formed a latticework beneath the Buckland Bridge, looking up at the underside of the street. A cold wind blew across me carrying the first drops of another rainstorm. I felt my head immediately regret it. It was a long way down. Okay. Being very, very still, I just floated myself back to the window. I told myself, not a problem. The two unicorn scribes appeared at the window above me, their horns glowing. Motes of magical energy formed around one of them, forming into eldritch daggers. I looked at little Macintosh, slipped into sats, and fired twice. Calamity flapped his wings, and the Sky Bandit lifted away from Buckland Cross. The rest of us huddled in the Sky Bandit, which is now considerably more riddled with bullet holes. Next stop, Calamity insisted, we would start putting armor on. While we still had most of a passenger wagon left, the Zenith was tending to Velvet Remedy, who was breathing heavily as she slept. The bullet lodged inside her flank, and Velvet Remedy had spent the battle digging it out 
while Zenith applied healing potions and Zebra poultrices as needed. Velvet would be okay, but she had lost a fair bit of blood and needed to rest. In the end, only two of the Buckling Cross ponies surrendered. We let them go in one of Cross's boats. I watched them as the crane lowered, shuddering under waves of deep hurt at how very few ponies were in that boat. We had stripped the fallen knights, scribes, and initiates, fourteen in all, and built a funeral pyre. They deserved that much. I was wondering if the outcasts would claim Buckland Cross for their own now. We would take our two water talismans to Friendship City and Stable 29. But first, we needed the rest. Aru had offered us sanctuary, and I was eager to take him up on it. The light from the pyre danced into the sky. As if summoned, a streak of green and gold appeared, whirling and pillowetting against the flames. I played the final audio log I had been able to recover as we flew through the darkness. I woke up in the hospital this afternoon. Apparently, I've been in and out of surgery for two days. Fortunately, the company is paying for most of the costs, seeing as I was injured on the job. I've gotten a frantic call from Miss Weather, who was screaming about murder. I rushed to the mall as fast as I could, telling her to send a terminal message to the police. We had a doozy of a storm last night before, and when I got there, Sunny Sud's laundromat was a complete disaster. Turns out, Jamacha Joe was right in that fucking huge ass billboard of Mr. Bean's. It fell. Damn thing came crashing down this morning, a good three hours after the storm had passed, tearing through Sunny Sod's roof. The murder victim, turns out, was Miss Weather's fucking poodle. She was screaming and hollering at Mr. Bean's so red-faced that I thought she would explode, claiming that he murdered her poor little walking piss dispenser, like he was the one who left her damn dog in the laundromat while she popped out for a cake. I can't say I didn't laugh. I didn't even see the batty old unicorn produced firearm. I still don't know where she was actually trying to shoot me, or if the bullet was meant for Mr. Beans, and her name was just bad. I'm told the police have her in custody. While I was in surgery, my stable tech broadcaster went off. I missed the call, but that was okay. According to the message, this is just a sh some sort of test run. Like those fire drills they do to make sure we are all in school. Or like we used to do in school. I decided not to mention it to my sister. She's already too much of a mess. Sis is here, looking more depressed and anxious than ever. I don't think she's been sleeping. I told her the doctors, I'll say I will be fine. I'll be up and about. Good as new. By the end of the week, I don't think she was really listening. I've been shot, and that's all she seemed to be able to focus on. Well, that and the other thing. Apparently, while I was in surgery, points from the Ministry of Morale paid her a visit. According to Sis, they were asking all sorts of questions about Darling. Weird things, like what she said on her birthday party, and about her internship last year with four stars. Sis was freaking out. I think... I think she's losing it. I've seen this sort of thing before, as much as I hate it. I think it's time to call the Ministry of Peace. They're the only ones who seem to be able to deal with wartime stress disorder. Where is every pony? I asked, trotting out of the sky bandit. Hello? It is late, Zenith intoned. They are likely all asleep. I nodded. I had fallen during our battle on Buckland Cross. And I looked out. All the stores were closed up, but there was light pouring between the boards covering the windows of Starbucked. I contemplated going there, but decided that I didn't want to break into a pony's home. Instead, I made for the comic shop with his collapsed front wall. I could hear the snores of the merchant, but I was so weary and emotionally exhausted that I could sleep through a firefight. I was not a good pony. I wanted to be a good pony. I tried to be a good pony. But today... Today... Hey! 
A voice hissed at me from the darkness. I turned to see Grandpa Rattle huddled in the shadows. I looked for any signs of a shotgun, and by that I meant stick. Instead, I noticed the red marks above his hind hooves. I knew such marks well. They meant he'd been shackled. And recently. My eyebrows raised an alarm. Shh! They don't know this mel old man can still pick a lock, he told me. Absolutely a judging, or judging not only by what he had seen, but what I had made of it. You and your friends want a hot tail without Arbu. This is no good place. I blinked. What, what do you mean? They seem pretty nice to me. Take a look in the basement, if you don't believe me. But don't say I didn't warn you. The basement? In the quick care. Where they kept the bodies they were going to burn tomorrow. I had a sudden, dreadful sinking in my heart. Grandpa Rattle looked around nervously. Y'all get, hear me? Get! Then he stumbled back into the shadows. I considered following him, then turned and galloped silently for helping hoof. The three ponies, or there were three ponies in helping hoof quick care. They were chattering about bowls of stew, cigarette butts, and a game involving black chits with white dots. They looked like a family. One of them, a mare, hardly older than a filly, just barely old enough to have her cutie mark. And I noted her arbu mark. They also looked like guards. Either way, no one saw me pass. The lock on the basement door was a surprisingly expensive one for a struggling town like this. Not that I didn't figure they could just have scavenged it from somewhere, but I didn't expect such a valuable would have been sold during their last bad year. It was the easiest lock I had picked that evening. The smell hit me immediately, followed by the sound of flies. But then, I was expecting to find bodies. I closed the door behind me, without a sound, and descended the steps cautiously, turning on my pit buck light. The two water talismans clinked together softly, still hanging from my horn. One of them I had procured for this town, risking my life the lives of my friends, killing ponies I didn't want to kill. Self-defense didn't make them any less dead. Clink, clink. The basement was in Abitur. Blood both new and very old stained the tile floors in spatters and streaks, running towards the drain embedded in the center. The bodies of ponies lay on tables, carved, not just open, but apart, skinned and flayed, the meat removed. I realized the dead from Arbu and bandits alike. The remains of more ponies were piled in barrels in a corner. Inside the barrels were the ref refrigerators. They were lined up like soldiers wearing uniforms of discolored white, except where they were stained with blood. Trembling, I approached one of them my skin crawling as I stepped into the sticky, wet floor. I reached out telekinetically to grab the first refrigerator. I felt a sinking horror at touching it, even with my magic. It was locked. So were the others, but that didn't stop me. I unlocked the first one and braced myself. I swung the door open. I saw the meat. I turned, reeling. My gaze caught a pony skull hanging on the wall next to the stairs, where I couldn't see it before. The skull is mounted on a plaque. Beneath it, some pony had soldered the word unity. We're all going to be together as one, ain't we? This was a bad year for us, so we took some solace in him. They ate him, I realized. My teeth chattered in the darkest edge of night. They killed the preacher, and ate him. Clink, clink. The black stallion, who had been Sandy Shore's father, lay on one of these tables. His ribs were cracked open, and they'd cut out his heart. It's an Arbu mark. We all get it after we eat the heart of our first kill. But I'd killed the colt's father, and I certainly wasn't going to. 
Oh, goddess. Says. I felt suddenly and violently ill. I stumbled against the wall, retching, trying to purge myself of every last bit of the evening's meal. My heart began to pound again. I felt dizzy. My concussion. And I'd killed for these ponies. I shuddered and vomited again, then spit repeatedly, trying to clear my mouth of the taste. I wanted to wash my mouth out with Rataway. The water talismans knocked together. Clink. The feeling of illness passed, leaving me to just feel violent. You're cannibals! I shouted as I burst back into the quick care, telekinetically lifting all three ponies and choking them. What the fuck is wrong with you? The wasteland isn't fucked up enough? The mother of the family, the same apricot unicorn mare, who had been collecting the bodies, levitated a knife from the table. I knocked it away with my own magic. You fed the colt his own father. You sick monsters. I raged, seeing nothing but red. The youngest mare was passing out. The other two struggled, the father trying to buck at me even though I was across the room. He only succeeded in kicking over the table, spilling black chits and ponies stew all over the floor. There was a rifle holstered on the underside of the table. The apricot mare focused, turning the whole table free to fire at me. Bang. The bullet impacted my armor, bruising badly as it failed to penetrate. It hurt, but it didn't even let myself wince. Where is the colt? I growled. I needed to find him, to save him from this place. Him, and anybody else who could still be saved. As for the rest... The father weakly pointed towards Starbucked. Thank you, I hissed as I pulled out the zebra rifle. Prat, 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 prat. I dropped their burning bodies and trotted out of the floor, out of the door. A pony stumbled towards me in the darkness. I swung the zebra rifle around, but stopped as I recognized the merchants. I heard a shot, the merchant pony said, looking around. Are the bandits back? I studied the pony a moment before asking, my voice dangerous and low. Did you know? The merchant froze, reassessing the situation. Know what? That Arbu is full of cannibals. That the meat they are selling to you is pony meat. Did. You. Know. The merchant pony blanched, looking immediately ill. The pony swayed, fighting to stay on all four hooves. That was answer enough. Go look in the basement, I said, pointing back the way I'd come. Bind the bodies in the fire, then go tell every pony you meet. I turned towards Starbuck, where light still poured out behind the boarded up windows. I could hear my friends galloping towards me, but I ignored them. Instead, I marched towards the door of the coffee shop. The righteous fury of hell followed behind me. DJ Pwn3 here, and I've got to tell you, I don't know what to make of this one, children. For weeks, I've been telling you about the heroic deeds of the Stable Dweller, our heroine in the Equestrian Wasteland, our bringer of light in this time of darkness. But today, another village in Manhattan has gone silent. Arbu is dead. Reports have reached me that every pony in the town over two dozen have been killed. And listen, children, I don't know how to say this, but it looks like it was a stable dweller who was responsible. A witness from Buckland Cross reported seeing her open fire on ponies of the Arbu Commons. Now, children, I don't know, and I don't want to believe this. I don't want to believe our heroine has turned on us. There must be more to the story than what I'm hearing. If you know anything about it, please contact my assistant homage at Ten Pony Tower. Anything at all. I don't know exactly what went down, or why, but I'm not going to stop until I find out. And when I do, you'll know too. This is DJ Poem 3, bringing you the truth, no matter how bad it hurts. Footnote, maximum level.